you very much, Namu, and good evening, uh, everybody, uh, uh, for joining us uh, today on Zoom or Facebook, or indeed if you are watching it subsequently uh, on our Facebook site, because we will we are recording. Uh, this annual public meeting so that we can convey it to other people who are also interested in observing it but unable to be here directly as it happens. So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. I'm, as Namu said, I'm Mike Moore, I'm Chair of Cambridge University Hospitals uh, uh, and I'm joined uh, today by most of the board members of the hospital, both executive and non-executive. Um, uh, 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 and uh, we're here collectively as board members to um, pay an important part to a really vital part of the hospital's role, which is we are a public institution. We are a public institution serving patients uh, uh, from across the country, given some of our characteristics as a highly specialist hospital. We're also a public institution serving as the District General Hospital for Cambridge and South Cambridge and its environs. And we take our responsibility to the public and to our locality and our local communities very seriously. Uh, uh, and so today is our, part of our way of being open to you as members of the public, to your questions, to your observations, uh, 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 and to listen to us uh, talk about uh, what we've been doing over uh, the last year. Um, I think um, we've all recognised that over the last two or three years has been a period of really profound challenge for the whole world. And there are very few times when one can say that, but it's truthfully said this time. And because of health issues and its consequences. And we are very appreciative that that, that has been a profound challenge for us as a hospital, for you as members of the public with anxieties for your health or for that of your family, and for patients in receipt or indeed deferral of receipt of services. Uh, and we recognise that that period of challenge is one that we continue to have. Um, we will hear later on uh, the ways in which uh, 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 we've, we've dealt with recovering from the initial phases of COVID, how we have worked with COVID and recovering for patients, how we have tried uh, as best within our power to respond to the delays in the treatment of patients. So these are and have been very challenging times, but we are very appreciative, as indeed other health providers up and down the country have been, for the very strong support uh, by, of, of us by you patients and community. Um, I can't speak for you just how much it means to people if I talk to intensive care nurses, if I talk to colleagues in A&E, if I talk to colleagues who are dealing with cancer patients, et cetera, et cetera, across the board, how appreciative colleagues are for the support that's been manifested in so many ways through this very challenging times. So I want to say, if you like, thank you to you, the community for supporting us. And I want to say also publicly, thank you to our staff and our teams for the exemplary way in which they have been challenging, uh, responding to those challenges. I know that we haven't got everything completely right. We know that uh, uh, and we are honest about that. I know that there will have been creations of periods of anxiety for you through delays or communication questions. Um, and again, we're open to that because it's only by being open to that and learning can we continue to improve. And that's very much the ethos with which we as a board uh, try to conduct the business of the board, not to skirt problems, not to avoid them, but to face them uh, 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 and to uh, ensure that uh, uh, we are the stronger for facing them not ignoring them. So we, this is part of that process of you being able to raise questions. Um, so 
Um, I'm told that our colleagues on Facebook are still struggling to get in. I will carry on and hopefully we'll have to, when, when Facebook, those who are accessing via Facebook are, are, are in. Uh, we, I won't go back to the beginning, but I'll, I'll, I'll pre-see it. Um, formally, this is an annual public meeting. Uh, those, those familiar with kind of company law will recognize the importance of those. And one of the uh, uh, um, uh, aspects of an annual public meeting is to present the formal accounts of the last year. These accounts have been uh, presented, they have been audited, they have been certified as okay. Uh, to bring to you. Uh, and so we are bringing those accounts. They are available on our website uh, 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 for your scrutiny. Uh, uh, and I'm very happy if there are any questions on those accounts uh, for those to be raised by you in the conversation. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll pick those up in the question and answer session a bit later on in the uh, in the session. Uh, just for the benefit of those uh, uh, of you, and I, I still think we've probably still not got Facebook, but for those who are watching on Zoom, if you can post any questions you have on the Q&A function on, uh, 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 on, on Zoom, you'll see that on the, on the bar at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A. If it's like my screen configuration, just to the right, of participants, so it's the second from the left, if it's the same configuration as mine. On that, you'll see the Q&A bar, and that will enable you to raise questions uh, of us. Um, uh, similarly, uh, when Facebook colleagues join us, uh, they'll be able to uh, highlight in, in a different way uh, the desire to raise questions, and we'll monitor that um, uh, 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 appropriately. Um, um, so uh, please bear that in mind. And if there are questions that you want to raise, just raise them on your screen uh, uh, and, and we'll pick them up. So I'm going to hand over, first of all, to, um, to uh, Neil, who is our uh, lead governor. Uh, the Council of Governors is a really important part of our overall governance. They play a very important part. Uh, and so I very much welcome Neil to, uh, to, 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 to talk briefly about uh, what the Council of Governors have been doing to support and challenge and scrutinise the board uh, 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 to make sure that we are the best hospital we can be. So I'm going to hand over now to Neil. Neil. Uh, great. Thanks very, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Mike. Um, just Firstly, by way of a uh, quick introduction, I became a governor back in 2017 through our election process and uh, was elected as a lead governor about this time last year. So I've been a lead governor for, for one year now. Um, I do a number of other things with the hospital as well. Uh, I would sort of describe myself as a, a sort of patient advocate, and I'm really passionate about there being a patient voice in all aspects of the hospital's operations. I'm a member of a couple of public and patient involvement groups. I represent patients in, our, in the MyChart stakeholder group, and I also lead or co-lead the patient advisory group for the new Cancer Research Hospital. Uh, and more, a little bit more about that um, later. So I want to cover uh, a couple of uh, main sort of themes. <clears throat> Firstly, to give you an overview of what we've been up to in the last uh, 12 months, and then uh, quickly run through um, five key areas of, um, of activity within the hospital, which the governors have had us as a particular focus on through this year. So firstly, on what we've been up to, just a reminder of what we do and who we represent. We represent all of you. So we've been elected by you in order to hold the non-exec directors um, to account for the performance of the board of the hospital. And we do that through um, regular meetings with um, the exec and the NEDs through what we call the Council of Governor meetings every quarter. And we also have special meetings with the non-exec directors where we can ask them, well, any question that we like. Uh, we also have the opportunity to observe in some of the uh, executive uh, 
um, meetings, such as performance and quality meetings, for example. Uh, and we also, um, uh, well, one thing ab about these meetings is that in the last, well, two and a half years now, we've had to run them all through Zoom, um, which has been quite convenient for many, but uh, it does mean that actually we haven't uh, met each other properly face to face for, for over two years now. And uh, for those governors who have joined us during the course of that two years, uh, have not had a proper opportunity to meet face to face. That is something we really want to address soon. We're going to try and do that at our next Council of Governors meeting. Um, the other way we can collect information and find out what's going on is through seminars, which we organise where members of staff give us information on a whole variety of topics. Uh, for example, um, building projects, finance uh, issues, medical ethics, staff survey results, just to name a few. We also had a, an interesting talk from Dame Mary Archer on the fundraising activities for the New Children's Hospital. So that gives us uh, a lot of opportunities to find out what's um, going on. We do also um, get rely on external uh, organisations to help us with our assurance process. And two, this year have been very, very important. Firstly, the CQC did an unannounced inspection of urgent and emergency care back in, back in March. And also we have an annual um, audit report from our external auditors. Um, the CQC report, um, as you may well know, um, basically sort of summarised the urgent and emergency care requiring some improvement. And this has led to um, a whole number of uh, initiatives uh, in the hospital, which I'm sure Roland will tell you a bit more about. But importantly for us, it has provided us a focus for asking questions to NEDS on the issues around uh, ED. Uh, and the excellent audit, I'm very pleased to say, uh, was, a, was a very good report. Uh, with no material findings, and they covered all the governance processes such as risk assessment and the finances, and they were all held to be or found to be in good hands. So uh, this is good support for my view that the hospital is, is very well managed. Um, we ran annual govern governor elections back in May, and three of our governors were re-elected. That's Ruth Green, Melissa Lee, and Howard Sheriff. And we also welcome one new staff governor, Mahad Nur. One of the important activities we did this year was to extend Mike Moore's tenure as chair of the trust. Uh, his ex extension is now to September 2025. And just briefly, the reason why we wanted to look at that was because we felt post his normal tenure, which would have expired in April next year, we were going to be under a lot of pressure for the new formation of the integrated care system and um, the running of uh, a number of very important high profile and political building projects, for example, the children's um, and the cancer hospital. And we felt that these uh, provided sort of extenuating circumstances to consider the options, so we did. Consulted a range of senior executives in and around the, the hospital, including the IC, the Integrated Care Board, and the uh, Cambridge University Health Partners, as well as members of the board. Uh, the Governor's Nomination and Remuneration Committee recommended extending the tenure, which was approved by the Council of Governors in June. So I'm very pleased to, to let you all know that Mike will still be with us, providing the excellent chairing role that he's been doing until 2025. Um, just now to cover um, some areas we've put particular focus on this year, there are five I'll just mention quickly. Um, they are the overall pressure on the hospital that uh, Mike has already mentioned, the new buildings program, maternity services, staff well-being, recruitment, and the move to an integrated care system. So on the pressure of the hospital, I, you know, governors are, are very aware, as you all are, on how pressurised the hospital has been, well, during the COVID pandemic, but also especially since the main bulge of that pandemic, pandemic has passed. And um, this has manifested itself in, in longer waits, 
for accessing your GP and waiting at ED, uh, shortage of beds, difficulties in discharging, medically fit patients and so forth. And, and this has caused us to ask a whole series of questions um, to the board and to our NEDS to assure ourselves that everything that can be done is actually being done. And, and I can assure members that this is a top priority of the board, and I'm sure you'll hear this from Roland in a moment, and is receiving you know, full attention. Um, there are, though, many factors outside the board's control in this, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, despite significant focus from staff, the situation is still far from what we'd like it to be. And as winter is approaching, the flu season coming upon us, um, I don't think we should expect to see things improve significantly over the next few months, you know, to be brutally honest. But the, the, the board and staff are working very hard to mitigate the risks. Um, on the more positive front, uh, on the backlog of elective um, operations, a lot of progress has been made in reducing that backlog. They've cleared out all the people who've been waiting over two years and now working on the one-year waits. On the new buildings programme, we have three governors sitting on the, uh, the executive committee, which is called Adam Brooks Three, which is looking at all the building programmes as well as the future uh, for Adam Brooks. Uh, and this allows us to be well informed and ask NEDS on the progress of all of those projects, particularly the new wards, which are being uh, staffed up now. Um, I mentioned that I lead the patient advisory group for the new cancer hospital. Uh, and that the whole point of that is to ensure that uh, patients get uh, are properly involved in all aspects of the design of the new hospital. If you have uh, experienced treatment with cancer or care for someone who has, then do feel free to join the Cancer Patient Network and get involved with that hospital. It's quite well on now, but still many opportunities to be consulted on various aspects of its design. Uh, maternity services. So um, there were two Ockenden reports on failures in care in Shrewsbury and Telford, and that's led to a number of national recommendations which are being implemented nationally. Um, we're lucky to have Professor Ian Jacobs, one of the NEDs, who's taken the lead on this area. He's uh, trained as a, in, this, in, in, in maternity services and uh, is very well informed on it. So we're using him to assure ourselves that the hospital is making good progress on implementing those recommendations. But again, it's not easy. One of the big challenges, and I'm sure you heard this on the news just yesterday, is staffing levels. You know, nationally, there's a big shortage of midwives and obstetricians, and that's now manifesting itself in filled up maternity wards and that story of that patient who ended up being moved around from four hospitals in the region and ended up in Leicester. So that wasn't a great outcome. Fourthly, staff wellbeing and recruitment. This is a very high priority and high focus area for governors. We rely a lot on our, our staff, and we have, in fact, four very proactive staff governors on, on our governing body, and they do a fantastic job of representing staff in the hospital. But is staff wellbeing is a, is a priority for all of us, because um, we know as patients how our experience in hospital can be influenced you know, by the quality and, and motivation of the staff caring for us. So we've been holding NEDS to account for assuring us that all possible steps are being taken to improve retention and recruitment. There's a number of practical steps being taken to, for example, create new breakout areas for people. There's some picnic tables outside um, the, the hospital now, which give people a chance to, to, to get away from it a bit. Hot meals for staff on, on shifts and so forth. And there's been a really notable increase in opportunities to recognize and thank staff. So we've had the you, you Made Difference Award for some time now, but we also had the COVID stars this year and also the awards dinner last week where a number of people were, were recognized for the fantastic contribution they make to the hospital. There's a continuous effort on recruitment, um, the international campaigns, local apprenticeship scheme with Anglia Ruskin, but we still have an increasing and high turnover rate of staff, which is a very complex issue, a mix of staff morale, um, cost of living in the Cambridge area, and it is particularly challenging that um, for our 
our region. And finally, interactive care. You're probably aware that the future of healthcare is moving now to a much closer partnership working across the whole network of providers uh, in the region from primary, secondary and tertiary care. Um, the idea here is to give patients a much better, cleaner, faster pathway uh, from their GP, say, through to emergency department, into the hospital, and then out again. And you should find, um, if this all works well, that you should be able to get to see your GP faster, you should have shorter waits in ED, and you should be able to get back home quicker after being in hospital. But the jury's still out on this. It's early days yet. Uh, and governors now engaging with the integrated care system, and the integrated care board to find out more about how we can help with this uh, new process. So I think uh, that's likely to be uh, the case that those five topics are going to be very high on our radar in the coming year as well. So just to just to finish off, hopefully that's given you a good overview of the work we've been doing on your behalf. Um, we have in. If I had to summarize, I'd say we have a hospital that's currently under immense pressure, but it is well led and it's staffed by a great team of people, all motivated to give you all the best care possible. Um, and I'd just like to finish off by encouraging you all to get involved in whichever way you can with the hospital, as a volunteer, as a member of a, uh, you know, uh, as a member of the hospital, or perhaps as a patient representative, in the various projects that we have, because together we can ensure an excellent healthcare outcome for people living in and around Cambridge if we do. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Neil, for that overview of the Council of Governors activities. Thank you, Neil, really, really helpful. Uh, I, first of all, can I just say my apologies to those of uh, on Facebook who have just uh, been able to join us. I do apologize that we were having some technical difficulties connecting the Facebook link uh, uh, and thank you for your patience and forbearance on that. We have started the meeting, so, so I should explain, I'm Mike Moore, I'm chair of the hospital, so uh, chairing today, uh, and so welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook. Um, uh, we have heard, I, I gave a few introductory comments, but primarily about housekeeping, which is to say, uh, invite you to bring in questions. So those of you joining us on Facebook, if you can just put that on the Facebook chat and we will be monitoring that uh, and able to relay those questions to the meeting uh, through that route. Uh, to remind those on Zoom who were already in, you've got the Q&A button at the bottom on your bar to use for that purpose. Questions that you raise, we will, we will pick up in the Q&A session after Roland's presentation as our Chief Executive, uh, and we will uh, take those questions. Um, uh, 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 we heard then from Neil covering his role as Lead Governor, uh, the role of the Council of Governors to hold the board to scrutiny and challenge to ensure uh, the public and patients that the board is acting in the right interests of the hospital and its public and its patients. Uh, 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 and Neil also rehearsed the very profound challenges that, of course, we all of us collectively face and are very much aware of uh, over that period. Um, for colleagues who are just joining us on Facebook, again, reiterate my apologies to you for that technical problem. Uh, and, and when we get towards the end of the, the, the scheduled close time of 6.30, let's just review. I'm happy personally to stay behind for Facebook, those who joined, if there are any particular points that you feel uh, you've been denied from that. But you will be able to watch the meeting up till now on our Facebook page, which will be, uh, which will, which is being recorded and will be shown again on our Facebook page. So, so you will be able to see what you have missed. But we'll let's review it at six thirty as to whether uh, there are lingering uh, desires from Facebook audience to to continue the discussion. So, I'm going to pass over to uh, uh, Roland as chief executive for his presentation. And any questions you've got for Neil or for others, we'll pick up in the Q&A session. So uh, over to Roland. 
Lovely, Mike. Thank you very much. And thank you also, Neil. Namu, if we could just go to my oh, the, the title slide, that would be great. There we go. Lovely. If we just hold there for a moment. So um, thank you so much for joining, um, joining the uh, meeting this evening. I wanted to talk, Mike, a little bit about a patient who we've been looking after. I then wanted to touch on some of the highlights um, and also some of the challenges of the last year before moving on to talking about the strategy that we've been developing with many of our patients, um, staff within the hospital and our partners across the health and care system uh, and, and, more, and more broadly. Um, so if I was to start, um, first of all, uh, with the patient and Namu, I can see you're desperately trying to get the slide back up, but no stress, just when you get to it. Um, what I'd like to do is to talk to you about a patient called uh, Derek Ayebu. Um, and Derek was a 46 year old uh, father of three children. And he had a really damaging and frightening road traffic accident, which led to him uh, getting a very deep infection within his leg. Here's Derek um, here being looked after by um, one of our colleagues at, at Addenbrooks. Um, and the infection in his leg was so serious that uh, the team were very worried that he might um, be facing leg amputation. And in fact, his life was in danger. Um, Derek needed multiple operations on his leg. He needed very powerful antibiotics. Um, but as we came into April 2022, so the big spring of this year, um, we were absolutely delighted that we were able to discharge him in that top 1% of successful recoveries from what could have been a completely life-changing um, life changing event for him. And now after more than five months of treatment, um, he's able to walk with the help of a frame. Um, and I think we're looking forward to him uh, being able to play football again with his son. And, and Derek is, is one of the tens of thousands of people who we're looking after both local people um, around Cambridge, but also people from across um, all of East Anglia, all of the Eastern region, and in some cases, further afield. And Mike, I could have picked any one of those tens of thousands of patients to talk about this evening, but I wanted us to start and ground ourselves um, in the story of Derek, recognising also alongside Derek, there are many patients who will have had a difficult time here at, at Addenbrooks and the Rosie. If we could just move on then, Namu, and Roland, just while we're slide. moving on, we should we should say that, of course, Derek has given his permission for to to be cited for this public meeting. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Mike. So, so if we look back over the course of the last year, first of all, at some of the real highlights and achievements, but then I'll come on to some of the profound challenges that we're facing. I could tell you, I think it's nine stories, but I won't. I'll I'll, I'll just mention three here. Um, so the first is if you look at the picture number two, which is the second one from the left at the top, um, that's a robot. Um, and that robot is helping us uh, look after patients with prostate cancer. Is It enables us to uh, support patients to go home um, in less than 24 hours after their surgery, as opposed to um, a normal hospital stay of between four and five days. And if you imagine, Neil, as you were talking about the long waits we're looking at for some of our uh, planned care procedures, it's this sort of investment te in technology alongside all of the staff um, and our partners outside of the hospital that's so central to us um, staying ahead of some of those long waits for care. So that's the first I, I wanted to, um, to mention. Um, then if you come down to picture number four and that absolutely beautiful um, piece of jewellery, that's the COVID star. Um, and we awarded 11,000 of those uh, to our members of staff and some of our partners um, as an act of gratitude for all of the extraordinary work and commitment that they put in during COVID and indeed have done, have done since. Um, if anybody hasn't received one and wants, wants one, I gather from David Werrett, our workforce director, there are two left um, and they're both on the uh, windowsill in his office. So um, I'm not asking for a tidal wave of applications, but a lot of those were handed out. And in some of the questions that we're having around support for staff, this may something, 
based on something that's trivial. It certainly wasn't felt to be trivial by those members of staff or the leadership of the hospital. And it's one of many things that we're putting in place to make staff feel um, safe, valued and welcomed when they come uh, here to work at Adam Brooks and the Rosie. Um, and then, then the third piece I just pick pick on um, is picture number nine. Um, so those are solar panels over some cars, and they're an example of the sort of work we're doing around the sustainability agenda. Um, so Karen Charlton, our director of capital estates and facilities, is very active in developing our own um, sustainable energy solutions um, alongside the Addenbrookes chimney. Um, for solar panels on the top of the Rosie Hospital, um, which is a hospital that many of you will know and I'm sure have used at different times. And I just wanted to highlight that, Mike, as an example of the sort of thing that we're doing alongside patient care, alongside supporting our staff, um, and alongside, if you like, or as an example of building for the future. If no more, we could come on then to the challenges. That would be great. So thank you. So alongside all of those extraordinary achievements and commitment from staff and engagement from patients, um, we're also facing really significant challenges. And if I think back to the world before COVID, I think back to the experience we had in the three waves of COVID, we're now facing into a period that I think will be more challenging than anything we saw in the last two and a half years. That isn't to catastrophize or, um, if you like, be pessimistic. It's just to face into the reality. Um, and, and as you can see here, three particular areas of challenge. So um, the weights in our emergency department are far, far from where we would like, uh, like them to be. And our work with colleagues outside of the hospital is absolutely central to us uh, before COVID. And we've done an enormous amount around innovation, but it, it's facing into a very significant uh, demand for care. Secondly, there you can see people waiting far longer for plan care than we would like. Areas where we've made enormous progress, Neil, as you were talking about, uh, but more to do. And it's not about more robots. About um, changes to pathways to make our investment in the additional 120 beds really work, and I'll talk about those in a moment. And then, thirdly, there um, is the uh, position in terms of staff pressures and shortages. So, before COVID, we had vacancy rates of around about three or four percent. A huge thank you to colleagues in the workforce team. Um, that's now in the sort of eight to 11% uh, range, and we need to do all we can to bring it back down to that three to 4%. It's a key part of ensuring you retain staff. Um, and I think Mike, Neil, and many other colleagues, I wouldn't trivialize any of these three challenges. They are um, serious, uh, difficult to tackle, and um, more serious than we faced during the last two and a half years of COVID. So, so those are the highlights and the challenges. Um, Namu, if we could go to the next page, I'm just going to show a short video on the strategy for the organisation. Um, so, Namu, are you are you going to move straight into the video, or do you want to pause for a moment there? Yep, I'll just play the video, and then if you let me know if you can hear the sound, that would be great. Thank you. Lovely. The best thing about working here is the opportunity to work with friends and colleagues yes. every day. Yes, we can hear. Make patients better. Working as part of a team, I feel really proud. I'm privileged that I'm working with such generous people that are caring and kind and have the same goal as me. I love working here and I know others do as well, but I am hearing that staff are tired and things have taken a toll physically and mentally for staff and uh, people need space to recover and recuperate. We're seeing more patients than ever before and sometimes we don't have enough staff, but we're here to make a difference and that's what we do. Even on the worst day of somebody's life, there's always something that we can do to make it a little bit better. We all have our own Addenbrook story, our own Rosie story, our own CUH story. And now we're ready to write the next chapter. The last two years have been beyond difficult for all of us. 
but through it all we've been there, representing everything that makes Cambridge University Hospitals special. Safe, kind and excellent. We delivered our last strategy and now we're looking at what's next. We're building on what we've achieved already and we're refreshing our strategy to meet the needs of our community, patients and staff for the next few years. The next stage of care, learning and research in Cambridge and beyond. Through listening to staff, we've created our new strategy and each of us here has a part to play. We have three priorities. Improving patient care, supporting our staff and building for the future. We're improving patient care by helping patients to stay well through working with health and care partners and providing more services in the community. We're also using new technology, new facilities and new ways of working to help patients get the right care more quickly. And we're always here in an emergency. We're supporting our staff by recruiting for this next phase and helping our current staff to keep learning and growing. Everyone is welcome in the CUH family and we value the diversity of our workforce. We're building for the future by expanding our state-of-the-art facilities, including our new children's and cancer hospitals, to power the next generation of innovation and research. The strategy belongs to all of us and it will continue to develop as we keep looking ahead, achieving our vision of a healthier life for everyone. The community around Cambridge University Hospitals is powerful. We all know we're stronger together. And we know we're making a difference. Then, now, and for years to come. Lovely, Namu. Thank you very much. I, I hope people were able to see um, or, or, or follow most of that video. I, I got some glitches in it, but I think the messages came through uh, very clearly. So, Namu, thank you. Um, so, so, could we come to the next slide then, Namu? Thank you. So, in terms of the, the strategy, we've talked a huge amount to patients, um, to our communities, our partners in general practice, community services, social care, the university, our partners on the biomedical campus, um, and, and, and listened. And we've alighted on those three big parts of the strategy that you heard in the video. So first of all, improving patient care, secondly, uh, supporting our staff, and then thirdly, um, maintaining that eye on the longer term and building for the future. Um, and there's a huge amount we could say about all of these different areas. Um, but just to say, pick on improving patient care, what you would have seen in the video um, would be, say, that third bullet point around new ways of working with partners in the health and care system. When we saw colleagues from neurology um, in the hospital working with colleagues in general practice to get much better care out of the hospital and closer to people's homes. Um, in terms of the extra capacity, um, you saw at one point um, two single storey buildings um, which are on what's called the 2020 land, just to the south of the main part of the hospital. Those are uh, 40 beds that we put in place during the pandemic as possible surge capacity to deal with COVID-19 that we're now in the process of repurposing to be uh, providing elective orthopaedics care. So that will be joint replacement and that sort of thing. Um, but at the heart of all of this is listening to patients and co-production of new ways of looking after people. 99.9% .9 of the time, the suggestions are uh, things that we can deliver on. The occasional point, 1% will be, for example, the children um, for the children's hospital being determined that we needed a small farm. Um, that's something we've not yet been able to get into the business case, but never say never. Um, Namu, could we come to the next slide? Yeah, so then the second part of the, the strategy um, is really around supporting our staff. And um, on that third bullet point there, we, we talk about well-being. Uh, and yes, psychological support. Yes, a lot of the support we see through um, the right sort of breakout space, uh, provision of um, appropriate mixes of food across the hospital 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, psychological support. Yes, if you like, wellness packages 
access to the Frank Lee um, on-site leisure facility. Um, but also at its absolute heart, there's that recognition and valuing of everybody's contribution that I talked about in relation to the COVID star um, award process and also the annual awards, Neil, that you referenced on Thursday of last week. Um, through to this enormous push on recruitment and retention. Um, and then equality, diversity and inclusion, valuing the whole person, um, recognising and celebrating diversity um, and enabling everybody in the COH family to, to give up their absolute best and have a really fulfilling and exciting uh, time here at COH. But always being grounded in, at the moment, um, enormous pressures around uh, cost of living, um, being, if you like, amplified through... Um, inflation and also in particular access to accommodation and transport here in Cambridge which we know is an expensive uh, place to, to, to be. If we then come to the next page uh, Namu, moving on to building for the future, um, a huge amount again that we could say here uh, and that we've already touched on um, I've talked to when I say closer integration with Southern Place, that's our closer working with colleagues outside of the hospital. Um, a great deal going on in terms of technology, um, use of digital infrastructure and data. I've talked about sustainability. Um, our work with the university and um, other partners in the Cambridge ecosystem is absolutely central to, I think, the development of uh, the two hospitals mentioned at the top of the page, the Cambridge Children's Hospital and the Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital, both of which we're quite advanced with, um, although I think always being grounded in some of the challenges we're facing, as you can imagine at the moment, with a change of national administration and some of the pressures that the economy is feeling at the moment. I suppose, Mike, and as I hand back to you, I, I think what we're really trying to balance here at, at Adam Brooks and the Rosie at Cambridge University Hospitals is um, is, is the real need and the real experience of all of our patients locally and regionally, in some places nationally. And that ranges from the patient waiting outside the emergency department when it's cold and wet, uh, trying to get into care, with the sorts of innovations that we're talking about in some of these videos. And then at the heart of all of that, what are we doing to wrap the very best support around all of our staff in the hospital, but also our partners outside. Um, and we've got to do all of that um, in the face of some uh, changes nationally, which at times make the path less smooth than we would perhaps like it to be. But Mike, I'll very much hand back to you now for um, the questions and answers session. Over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Roland. And thank you to Neil before you. And thank you to members of the public who are submitting questions. Uh, that we, I have eight questions on the Q&A on Zoom, uh, and uh, as uh, 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 colleagues uh, uh, come in on Facebook, if you use the, 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 the chat messaging function on Facebook, we will monitor those and be able to relay those into the conversation. And in addition to that, uh, we had pre-submitted questions from a number of people, uh, 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 which we do. So I'm going, to, and there's a mixture of questions. Some of them are around the physical buildings, some of them are around patient care, some of them are around uh, uh, staff and how we support staff, et cetera. So I'm just going to, to start with the first question that was submitted before the meeting, um, uh, 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 which um, is question one. Ian, just so that, are you going to read the question out or is it, or, or, or is that available to everyone? How, how are we going to just do this? Um, I'd be happy to read it out, Mike, if that's helpful. If that's okay, because I'm conscious that not everyone uh, will, will do it. So over to you. Yeah, so the, the first question was from John Beadsmore. Um, and, 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 and John um, says, I'm receiving excellent treatment from the staff at Asenbrooks, um, but I'm concerned about the status and well-being of the staff. My impression is that they have um, frugal, if any, changing facilities, often toilets, which is probably why staff are seen on buses in uniform and occasionally greens. They do not seem to have defined breaks, and when they do seem to lack the appropriate provision of food on a 24-hour basis and, and nowhere to eat. And, and, and John goes on to suggest that the, the governors and, and, and the board sort of pay, pay close attention to this matter and, and potentially sort of survey staff about changing facilities, breaks and food availability. 
Thanks, Ian. David, I'll suggest you come back in on that, and then maybe Karen might uh, add to that. But just before I bring you in, David, uh, John, you you preceded your question absolutely fairly with a with a with an observation that the uh, I'll quote you: the NHS is defined and controlled by politics which means the board and executive, whilst being responsible for the operational running of the hospital, are subject to meeting the continually changing whims and pressures of politicians, but hopefully the governors and members are, are not. Uh, the, way, the way I see it is that um, we are absolutely honest and straightforward as a board on the nature of challenges. Uh, it, 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 we're, we're not, uh, we're, we're not, so to speak, functionaries of government, albeit we are a public service. And so we are, I, I, I take the view and the board takes the view that we are very open to things, even if they are potentially embarrassing politically, if they are appropriate to the proper functioning of the hospital. So the board is independent. We're not government appointees. Uh, 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 and whilst we recognise we are responsible as public servants in public service and a publicly accountable institution, uh, we are very uh, open to all kind of challenges. You are right that, of course, we have to negotiate with government in order to further the interests of the hospital and healthcare in this in this county, um, but not as functionaries of government. And so don't worry, if you like, if you think that we are in any way limited or fettered in that kind of way, particularly on something like you're raising about the quality of uh, provision of services to our staff, because staff are central to our mission. But David, do you want to just answer the question directly? And, and if Karen wants to come in on any of it. Great, thank you. And thank you for the question. And good evening to everybody. Um, so absolutely, as the Workforce Director for the organisation, alongside my executive and board colleagues, um, absolutely share and discuss and debate and are passionate about um, sharing, sorry, driving the um, uh, a focus on improving the experience of all of our staff in a number of ways, including the environment in which they work in and the environment in which they get away from the work they do. So listening to staff, um, undertaking processes to hear what's important to staff, what their experience is right now, how we can improve, and that the steps we put in place do improve is important to us across wellbeing and a whole range of other things which inform our workforce strategy, such as resourcing, for example, are there enough staff in the hospital? So wellbeing that you, you highlight in the question sits alongside other ambitions we have um, for our workforce. Now, I think you, you're, you're, you're flagging up something which is not that easy to sort of cover in one bland statement. We have an environment in the state which varies considerably from buildings of 50, 60, 70 years old, right through to, to very updated, very modern new facilities, which we have designed in our generation, in our time um, to meet those needs. So one size does not fit all um, in our organisation. The experience of staff is not consistent in terms of the environment they work in and, uh, and have breaks from. So what we continue to do is the listening process. Um, Karen, who's going to talk in a moment, may mention, for example, the review, the audits of the experience in specific areas across the organisation and a corresponding action plan around things such as um, space to have food in clinical and non-clinical areas. Um, the environment in the public areas, in the concourse and the food available through those, those routes. Um, so, what I'm saying at this stage is this is absolutely important to us. We hear, we listen, uh, we understand it. it. It varies hugely and we are focused on improving it in various areas. It fits very much as part of a workforce strategy, which, which as I say, um, uh, um, has much attention, it, um, including at the board. But Karen can put some meat on that if she wishes. Just, just before I bring you in, Karen, thank you, David, that's really helpful. Just before I bring you in, Karen, th the end of your question, John, rather suggests that we would not be informed by staff surveys and wouldn't it be a good idea if we were. Actually, uh, the board pays a lot of attention to frequent staff surveys 
uh, in it, uh, which are, I don't, David, you'll be able to let me know just how frequent they are, but they are both national surveys and local surveys. We follow the issues that are raised in those surveys, which talk about what it feels like to work in CUH, how you could do stuff better for us to make it a better environment in which to work. And, 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 and we follow those survey outcomes assiduously through individual committees of the board and at the board level. Uh, and I, I would say as the chair of the board, staff retention at the moment is my number one worry. Uh, because we recognise for various reasons of which physical environment is, is merely one factor at the moment that's very, very challenged. But Karen, I, I, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike and, and David. So I, I'm Karen Charles and I'm the Director of Capital Estates and Facilities. Um, and, and I absolutely concur with what both Mike and, and David have um, said and also Neil earlier. So absolutely, the, this is a, a really a uh, varied picture. We, um, over and above the staff survey results, we also work very closely with our management staff forum uh, to help guide where staff um, feel that we, we need to be focusing on. But what we're not doing is focusing in just one area. We have got action on multiple fronts, ranging from improving uh, local facilities that, that staff have. Uh, David mentioned the survey. We surveyed 78 um, staff areas. We have got a program of works to improve those areas from making sure there's um, a water boiler to refresh seating to, to painting and, and, um, and some phase one, some, some basic um, elements. Recognizing that we have got a constrained footprint so just focusing in the locality is not um, the only answer. So we've also been doing some work on more centralized facilities, um, external seating areas, improving um, the, the seating areas that we do have. Um, and hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll also see completely refresh of all of the seating within the, the, the food court and concourse to very much to help support staff. Um, that is ongoing. Um, it very much links to the wider piece of the environment in which people work um, and, and we will be, be focusing on that on a continued basis. And we're also taking some of what uh, staff are telling us into the design of the new Cancer and Children's Hospital as well, having an opportunity to um, extend some of our state-of-the-art facilities um, and, and refresh some of our 60, 70 year old, old properties. Um, so I will just uh, pause there and happy to take questions either later or, or if, if people have got individual questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And um, next question, I'm just going to pick up, which is again from John, uh, because I'm conscious questions are now beginning to come in quite a bit. So we will need to keep the pace going if we're to try and uh, cover as many of the questions as possible. Was a question about... Um, whether or not the building and the size of the building has kept pace, or really the question is saying the building has not kept pace with the growth of the surrounding population and the particular manifestation of that in regard to, for example, an A&E department, which is too small for the population uh, of, of the, 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 that we serve. And the question is to um, how is there some form of future vision that's kind of enabling us to think about what our capacity should be going forward and, and whether governors and members are involved in that? Nick, could I bring you in as our director of strategy on that point? Yeah, of course, Mike. Um, so uh, we do have a programme uh, that addresses the capacity requirements, both in the short term as well as reaching out to the, the long term as well. Um, so that program is called the Addenbrooke's Three program, and it's set up in three phases. The first phase really talks to the immediate, urgent uh, capacity constraints that we face across uh, Addenbrooke's. Um, and within that, we have um, approved, funded um, programs of work, uh, partly funded through the National Surge program. Um, so that will deliver 120 additional beds partly funded through elective recovery funds nationally, which are gonna help us build a new elective orthopedic center. Uh, and also in addition to those things that are already funded, uh, we have a business case currently going through our own internal processes for the expansion of capacity in our emergency department. So that's due to go to our performance committee in October. 
So those are just some examples of the immediate term in phase one. Phase two really talks to the cancer and children's hospitals, which you've already heard about. Um, happy to, to comment on those in further detail later on, because I know that there's been quite a lot of information provided on those already. And then the third really looks to the much uh, longer term. And uh, this is a program of work which is not yet funded, um, but really is critical around how we develop the plan for a new uh, acute hospital on the Edinburgh site. Um, so th that's the programme. The, the question about our governors, well, absolutely. So governors are on the Edinburgh's three subcommittee to the board, and we also run quarterly sessions with governors, both to brief, but also seek input to the design of those plans within that programme. Thank you, Nick. And, and implicit within that is a, a clear recognition that we accept the point that John is making, which is that, for example, the A&E department hasn't grown commensurate with the growth of the population uh, and, and that's very much uh, we're aware of. Um, can I move on then to the final question from John and then I'll, I'll mix it up a little bit. Uh, it, it, that's a question in regard to um, the fundraising activity with ACT uh, and the kind of you're slightly questioning whether it's right that a charity like ACT should be funding major pieces of equipment like MRI scanners and surgical robots uh, and also whether or not ACT could be deployed more effectively on supporting staff. Can I bring you, Roland, in for that? Thanks very much. So, so a couple of points from me. Um, so first, I, I would say that since 2010, the position in terms of capital investment for buildings and equipment has been an area of some limitation for the NHS. Um, but I'm very pleased that over the last 18 months to two years, um, with a big thank you to, to Mike Keach, our CFO, and Adrian and Daniel in uh, our performance committee, we managed to bring in quite a lot of additional capital into CUH. I think Mike, Adrian, Daniel, approaching 90 million for the financial year that's just ended, or 70 to 90 million. Um, and that is enabling us to, if you like, rebalance in terms of how um, the NHS is investing in buildings and equipment versus other people. The second point I, I make is we're enormously grateful to the support of ACT, Adam Brooks Charitable Trust. It's everything from chocolates and daffodils and well-being support, which is not trivial, through to investment in, um, if you like, mid-sized pieces of equipment around things like imaging, through to terrific support across the region for major fundraising for children's and cancer. And that's not just the money, it's about the network that we're building with our much broader community. And then um, f finally, in terms of um, the basics of what the infrastructure is like and what people's lived experience is like, um, absolutely a central part of what we're all doing in the um, broader community in COH is being very grounded in what life is like. So um, if I was to take you to the genomics laboratory hub, you would see a really positive working environment doing extraordinary things. If I was to take you to our overcrowded emergency department waiting room on a Monday evening, it's a very different lived experience for patients and staff. And I think we could all point to different parts of the hospital where we're seeing something that's terrific and something that's very challenged. Mike, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. So I'm now going to move on. Uh, good evening, Annabelle, who are Annabelle Sykes, I think from Shelford, if it's the same, Annabelle, welcome. And you've asked to give an update on the timeline for the cancer research and children's hospitals that have been referred to earlier. Um, Nick, do you want to just update us on that? Absolutely, Mike. So um, I'll talk through uh, the cancer hospital timelines and the, the children ones are very similar to it. So the stage we're at at the moment is developing the outline business case for the cancer research hospital. That's due for submission this October, so October 2022. We then would move through subject to, to national approval to developing the full business case um, that would be submitted in August 2023. Um, we then look to have um, the start of, of building in March 2024 with a timeline for completing in summer 2027. And the children's program is, is very similar to that, slightly behind, um, deliberately behind in terms of the uh, uh, outline business case that's due to be submitted uh, this December. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And, uh, and still on the issue of children and cancer hospitals, can I uh, go over to Karen? Karen, there's a question from Liz Owen 
And Liz, you raised two questions. One of those questions we'll deal with directly with you because it related to a particular episode of patient care or non-care, as you saw it. So very happy to, 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 to talk that through with you directly. Um, but you, your other question was, with the building of the children's and new cancer hospitals on site, I've been made aware that provision for parking, particularly disabled parking, have not been factored into the planning. Why is this and how will you remedy this? Karen, are you able to address that? Yes, thank, thank you, Mike. Um, we have got um, full planning permission for our Cambridge Children's Hospital, and as part of our planning process, um, parking is an act is a, is a major a major component. So we have got provision for disabled parking and also for drop off spaces. Um, right outside of the hospital and um, so that that's taken care of and, and then within the cancer hospital um, we will be submitting that planning application in, in due course but that that is absolutely factored in is it easy to fit all of that in no certainly not so we are still working through some of those um, components but also our whole access strategy is also um, you know, need to look to the future with Cambridge South Station opening up um, in due course and, and other public transport schemes as well. So we need to make sure that the spaces that we do have on site, we safeguard for those people who, who absolutely do need that. And that includes our, our uh, patients and staff that need a safe access. We are also very, very fortunate to have two courtesy buses on our campus. Uh, one has been established for a long time and one is relatively new that's been so generously um, funded by, by one of our, our, our patients. So um, that also helped people access public transport um, and have easy access um, to, to the hospital destination. So it's a mixture of, of components, um, but just please rest assured that uh, disabled parking is not being forgotten. Thank you, Karen, very helpful. Can I then, I'm going to bundle a couple of questions together, which in a sense relate to finance generally of the NHS. Um, and one is one of the pre-submitted questions from Stefano Pasucci, uh, which he makes the suggestion that patients when they leave the hospital might have on their records how much their care has costed. And I think the thinking that Stefano has is that is that actually, in a sense, being a free at the point of use service, people don't necessarily understand just how much it has cost. It's not that he's suggesting that people are charged for that. I think it's just more a transparency about how much it's cost. So, Mike Keach, could I ask you perhaps to think about that one? Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. And, and those that don't know me, I'm Mike Keach, I'm the Chief Finance Officer. And Mike, in Stefano's question, there's some, there's some additional information and, and, and Stefano sets out actually the currency that we work with is, is people and the outcomes that we deliver for our patients. That's, that's first and foremost, and we saw that on the videos earlier. I think the, the point is a really interesting one is, can we also demonstrate value in monetary terms as well, in terms of what our patients receive? I think it's a really complex issue. Our, our patients are, are taxpayers. As, as well as patients. Um, I think the reality is in, in the situation we're in at the moment, we need to recognize it would be complex and, and quite time consuming to implement a model where we are setting out as described what, what the, the, the treatment has cost and that it is provided for free at the point of use. So I think at the moment we'd be saying our, our focus needs to be on the efforts improving patient care and experience but we recognise as well that there is a, a financial value that is um, provided in the care that we give. I hope that's OK, okay Mike. No, that, that, that's fine, Mike. And as I say, we're, we're giving you quick answers to these. I recognise that sometimes the question might want a more discussion. But so link that to the question that's coming on the Q&A chat on Zoom, which is from David Blake, which I'll read out. There are often comments in the media that solely putting more cash into the NHS is not the answer to overcoming delivery problems. Within the current NHS framework, will you ever meet patient need and aspiration, or is a new funding operational and organisational model required with a clearer definition of what can be delivered? So I, I don't think that's capable of a five second answer, but, but I'm, I'll give you 20 seconds, Mike, and if Roland wants to add anything to that. Great, it's a fantastic question. I, I'm not sure I could, could answer the specifics on what the right value is for the NHS in terms of financial um, funding. But, but I think what I would say is money acts as an enabler for the other things that we do. And, and what we've set out in our strategy 
is the other priorities for the organization. So developing our workforce plan, working as part of our wider system to develop the integrated care partnership that we think is key to developing a different model of care for our patients locally. And I think that's what David might be hinting at, a different model of care, not just for this organization, for our system. Money needs to act as an enabler for that. I can't give a specific, but David's absolutely right. We need to be thinking about other things as well. And Roland, do you want to add to that? Because of course it links into the whole point about integrated care. It links into issues about how we how we are able to demonstrate we are using our money, taxpayers' money, as effectively and productively as possible. Thanks, Mike. And David, thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Um, so, so, so I think a, a number of points. So the first I'd say is I think it's quite difficult at the moment to come up with a really good analysis of what's going on. And that's because of the enormous pressure in terms of people trying to access care and the pressure that staff are feeling. Um, and also the sort of request for cash that come or investment that come very frequently. So we've got quite a hot muddled situation that it's quite hard to disentangle. Looking ahead, um, I think absolutely we support the, um, the move to, if you like, build our pathways of care and our teams around the patient, around the citizen, and to move as far as we can into population health, prevention, and only treating people when they really need that care. So the integration agenda is absolutely central to what we're, we're trying to do. Um, I think alongside that, what we're really needing to move to is a benchmarked settlement of some form of investment from either the government or the population that matches our peer countries. And then I think the key piece, Mike, as you were saying, is getting that on a much longer term basis. So really over 10 years, what would that investment look like? And then how would we be investing in the right sorts of technologies and buildings and staffing models to be able to deliver that care? Um, so it's not broken, but we need to get into a much longer term model. Mike, over to you. Thanks very much, Roland. Um, I'll just note there's a question from Councillor Philippa Slatter that was submitted before the meeting, uh, and she was referring to the fact that as a local ward councillor, she sees residents complaining about theft of bikes from the campus, uh, presumably staff, staff thefts, thefts from staff of their bikes as they're at work. Um, Karen, can we go back to Philippa as to how we handle that? I mean, she's not here tonight because she's indicated that she wouldn't be, but if we can go back directly to Philippa and we'll put that, given it's out in the public agenda, we'll, we'll put that answer up on, the, up on the website. So thanks, Karen, if I just ask you to, to do that, if that's okay. Um, um, can I go on then to um, uh, uh, some questions in regard to... Um, uh, there's a question about does the ICB have input from the ambulance service and from 111? I, I think I can say the answer is as far as the ambulance service, yes, the ambulance service for the East of England is represented on the ICB. Their challenges, they are represented as the East of England, they are represented on six ICBs, so they've got quite a challenge to achieve that. The question about is the ICB have input from 111? I think the answer to that, Roland, will be no. Is that right? So you're right, Mike. It doesn't have a, a formal seat on the ICB, but it's very active in terms of the uh, care we're providing to patients. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then I'll. Um, there's a there's a question. Uh, there's a number of questions from Anthony, who are, which I'll come on to as a bundle, Anthony, if that's all right. So I'm not I'm not I'm not putting you to one side. I'm just. Uh, can I pick up the the question about from Claire Stacy, uh, which was the question about whether or not uh, uh, rare diseases as a patient group are adequately covered in the COH strategy. I'm not sure if Nicola is here, but Nick, any, anything you want to say on that? So, um, Mike, I, I think the things that I would say are, would be fairly high level and, and general in okay. terms of grounded in our principles, but clearly provision of, of services for patients with rare diseases is absolutely integral to our role as a provider of specialised services across uh, the regional geography to, to people across the region. So this is, is absolutely a must do for us. And I know we've already touched on routes to getting feedback from patients, surveys, other routes as well, making sure that the things that we are planning, the cancer hospital, 
the children's hospital, both of which will have very considerable components for, for patients with rare diseases, are co-designed with patients. Um, so that, that would be my, my starting point, but then quickly following say, there's always more we can do. So if there are gaps, we should alert ourselves to them and fill them quickly. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Neil, as, as lead governor, you've indicated your interest as advocacy on behalf of patients. How, how, the, the, the context of patients with rare diseases, um, any thoughts you've got on that as to whether or not we should be improving that? Well, I think we should be improving, but how we might improve it? Yeah, that's a really good point. I, 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 I'm not aware myself of a patient advocacy group already established around rare diseases except insofar as rare diseases do then manifest themselves in, for example, um, cancer services. So um, what I can say, though, that there are a number of uh, patient representation groups at um, CUH. Uh, for example, the Cancer uh, Patient Partnership Group, which I'm a member of. And there's also one for, for IBS as well. And uh, it could well be possible to form a similar kind of group uh, for those who uh, have rare diseases in order to represent that important constituency. Um, once those groups are established, then they can link in with the relative medical the relevant medical teams and be part of their meetings and uh, have regular communication with them and influence and participate in joint projects to improve services in those areas. Okay. I just uh, I open it up if anyone else wishes to add to that, because I'm conscious that we do have mechanisms with rare diseases groups. I, I, I've been involved in some discussions in my time as chair, but maybe Amanda or Justin or possibly Ian will be aware of anything else that we haven't already covered in the answers to that. And if, if they if they wish to add anything, please do. Uh, if if not, that's that's fine. No. OK, well, we'll take it that that that. Um, Edna raises the question, the first of the questions on the Zoom QA, what do you think would help with recruitment apart from the obvious of salary, e.g. housing, public transport, changing visa restrictions? David, can I, I mean, I, there's then a range of questions that Anthony's raised, which kind of in a sense relate to aspects of that, which I'll now come into. But David, before we get into things like housing or public transport, do you want to answer anything else that you think in terms of visa restrictions or or such like that, where 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 we're thinking, or where we would value any further help. Um, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Edna. So it's a very good question, and, and I'll start with that, that list, please. So accommodation, um, salaries, cost of living, all those sorts of things are really important to us. Travel, travel to transport as people commute further distances. So those are very good starters for what makes CUH a good place to work and adds or detracts from our um our position as a employer there's just a couple of there's a lot that could be said but I just add a, a couple one is um opportunity and development opportunity to do, to do the job that people are skilled and enthusiastic about doing so coming to CUH to be a nurse in a functioning team or a doctor in a specific area um and so on so so we often we get lots of feedback about the opportunities that CUH offers for people to operate at the very, very top of their game. And that feeds through to reputation and that feeds through to um, the employment pipeline, as challenging as it is. So uh, something we track and monitor, we talked about surveying earlier on, for example, we, we monitor every quarter, all staff, we have a big survey launching on Monday. Um, one of the big indicators we'll look at is um, the recommender score. Do our staff recommend us as a place to work? And that leads to a very, very rich stream of intelligence about what our staff say is our, uh, is, is our strengths and, and, and uh, our, our weak points. And that informs the action plan that we talked about earlier on. So I'd say it's nuanced, it varies according to staff group, but we are very attuned to what our staff say about us as an employer. On the visa issue, we're pretty good on international recruitment. It's a very, very successful pipeline for us. We have good teams. We have in-country support. Um, we, of course, are focused on the ethical aspects of international recruitment as far as we're able to, to, to pursue that, um, uh, that particular route as well. Um, so it's multifaceted. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. 
Uh, so can I come on to the first of Anthony's questions? Or it's not the first in order, but it's linked to what we've just touched on, um, which is at, at what conversations we are having with the Combined Authority Skills Committee regarding long term plans for ensuring adults wanting to switch careers are able to do so. For example, new lifelong colleges, as, as called for by the House of Commons Education Select Committee. Anthony, one of the things we should say is that the elected mayor, I, I mean, I, I represent CUH on it. Uh, 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 we, we sit together on the uh, ICP, which is the Integrated Care Partnership, which is a combined with the Health and Wellbeing Boards. Certainly, we've talked about uh, 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 the absolute centrality of skills. Um, post Brexit, we've very much recognised that actually the health economy, as a as an employer and as a skills developer, has a fundamental role to play. And the elected mayor and his team have been in on the campus and discussed that. And if we think about apprenticeships, I think the CUH story is one of the best in the country in terms of optimising apprenticeship scheme to upskill people for nursing, for example. Um, but David, anything you want to add to that in terms of conversations we're having with the skills committee? Um, no, you've said it very well, Mike. We have some meetings coming up, actually, to talk specifically about uh, what we can do in partnership and collaboration. But just to highlight, just to build on what you've said, our role as a provider of education, as a supporter of careers has changed over recent years. We are much more hands on in commissioning and being a partner in the delivery of, 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 um, of formal education programmes. And one of the amazing things that, that I feel immensely proud of that CUH is doing is around apprenticeships, as you say. We're almost um, spending our full apprenticeship levy, um, over two million pounds. Um, each year on supporting apprenticeships. We have a school of nursing, which effectively is about 400 nurses um, at any given time that they're going through training. In a few years back, we had none of that. Um, and those sorts of things are allowing people to develop their career, to change um, during the course of their lifetime, particularly moving from healthcare assistant into registered nurse or allied health professional, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so a lot of work is happening at CUH. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Okay, thank you, David. So, Anthony, I'm going to go back to what was your first uh, question. It was a question actually you, you pre-submitted to before the meeting, but it's also the first on the Q&A seat on the Zoom. So reading it, which is in terms of the staff shortages, what conversations are CUH having and the NHS with the local planning authorities, the mayor and the combined authority and county council to identify and secure new sites for key workers? When I was an inpatient last Christmas, I spoke to many staff who said they were not aware of the consultations on the emerging local plan, city, South Camps, DC, or the local transport plan. Uh, now, we have a lot of engagement. That I'm not surprised, to be honest, that, that frontline staff wouldn't necessarily be aware of all that. Uh, it, it, we do communicate that, but it's I recognise that there's lots we communicate within the... But, uh, uh, Karen, do you want to just say a little bit more about how we engage in the local planning process? Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, and and really good good questions um, uh, around this. And in, in terms of key worker housing, we commissioned a detailed piece of work, um, detailed research in in twenty twenty that that highlights um, the well known um, affordability challenge that um, our state uh, staff face. Um, and we published that. So Savile's worked with us on that um, with a range of st stakeholders across uh, Greater Cambridge area, the mayor, the planning director, housing officers, councillors, and, and subsequently also um, the, uh, a range of developers. And the local authorities' view is that they don't mind to allocate sites specifically for key workers, but that a blend of affordable housing products are re really required um, to meet the needs more, more generally. So we continuously work with the, with the, the officers. Um, just recently, there's been a permission local to us that um, where a local lettings plan has been, been approved. So that's all, all really positive. We continue to explore innovative models um, with developers as well, including discounted private rented accommodation uh, within the build to rent developments um, that are tailored to, to the NHS needs. We're also working um, very closely together with the rest of our um, CBC campus partners and uh, really developing a, a whole case in terms of the, the housing need for, needs for our staff. So that's particularly on, on housing. 
and, and, and the local plan. And as a campus, we are fully engaged with the local planning authority in terms of the, the local plan. Um, and it's also very much interlinked with some of our live planning applications that we have now. So, so as a as a community of the CBC, we are we are fully engaged in in that. And, and like you, Mike, I we, we can always communicate stuff more with with staff, but we do communicate quite a lot. And, and some of this detailed technical work, what we're doing is we're utilizing in effect data from what what staff are telling us. Um, where staff travel from, what are the big housing corridors, um, all use that as data to, to help support our case. Thanks, Karen. And as you say, we regularly have conversations with, for example, the chief executives of South Cam's Cambridge City, with the director of planning for the shared service across both those two authority areas, with Rachel Stokepard as the as a director of the Combined Transport Scheme Authority, so and and with the chief executive of the county council. So we we are engaging. That I'm I'm sure uh, you know we'd all like to see more done, uh, but but the engagement certainly is 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 there. Can I go on then to Anthony's other question, which is the Greater Cambridge Exec Board notes the conclusion of updated Cambridge Biomedical Campus Transport Needs Review that, in quotes, even with all the planned transport interventions for the site, there will still be a surplus 4,000 plus daily journeys over the sustainable target. What's the plan? Have we had conversations with the, the Connect Light Rail project? Again, Karen, I think <coughs> that would probably be the best place to, to answer that. Yeah, th thank you, Mike. Um, we engage um, on all fronts with public transport uh, schemes. We are, without that, the issues of um, that we face in terms of cost of living, uh, connectivity, staff being able to access the, the, the campus just uh, keeps co compounding. So we respond to all of the, the consultations. Um, we make recommendations for consideration and also for integration across the, the, the different schemes. Um, we, you know, the, the Greater Cambridge Partnership has been challenged with a transformational um, program of how to transform um, access in, in, into, into Cambridge. So we really do need all of those um, schemes to, to, to deliver, as well as us really thinking very carefully also about who comes onto the campus um, and utilizing technology to save people from traveling to site, um, patients um, and also staff really carefully considering whether staff do need to to, to come to work so um, we have also got a, um, a combined uh, travel and transport group on the, the, the Cambridge Biomedical Campus so we are absolutely plugged into that there is not a simple answer to how we deal with the with the 4,000 plus journeys. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the last question on the on the Zoom uh, Bar. It, it, uh, apologies, Kathy. Kathy has asked, "What does IBS stand for?" I think you mean ICB, but but what does it stand for? My apologies. I'm afraid um, if Rohan, who's one of our non-executive directors on the board, was sat by me, he would already have chastised me for letting an acronym go without explanation. So I apologise uh, for that. I'm afraid it's a a hazard of the NHS that that ha is a habit. So I apologize to you for that. The ICB, if that is what you are talking about, is the Integrated Care Board. And essentially the government have introduced a new approach to care. We had about 10 or 11 years ago, a model that was built around the idea of the best way to get best health services was through a relatively competitive mechanism by which people tendered for the delivery of services. Uh, 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 and that tended to have the downside that things got relatively isolated and atomized, if you like. Uh, the Integrated Care Board was an attempt to move away from that, which promoted the idea that it was us working alongside our colleagues at Northwest Anglia Foundation Trust, which is Hinchinbrook and Peterborough, us working alongside Patworth, us working alongside primary care, collaboration was the better way of, of dealing with that. Now, if that, that is if, if that is what you are referring to by IBS, it's the ICB. But if I've misunderstood you and there is another IBS acronym that I am not familiar with, then I would welcome uh, 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 the answer. And I, I see that Neil might be typing an answer, so I, I may have misunderstood you. But apologies for letting an acronym go slip. Um, are there any questions, Sophie, from the Facebook side? No. There's no further questions from Facebook, no. Okay. 
So I think miraculously at half past six, we seem to have answered quickly, I accept, all the questions that have been raised. Just to look around, just to check any final opportunity, particularly from those of you who are tuning in from Facebook and therefore were delayed in entry into the into the, the meeting, for which again, apologies. Uh, happy if there are any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, IBS was irritable bowel syndrome. Sorry. Yes. So it wasn't. It wasn't integrated care board. So that was me. See, acronyms. Acronyms fail us all. Yeah. So Mike, it, was um, me, it was me that used that acronym as well. Acronym as well. So I'm the guilty party. Apologies. Okay. 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 So apologies to all. See, so that just goes to show the explanation of the of the acronym is really important. Um. Um. So. I think if that if there aren't any further questions, my thanks to everyone, members of the public, for your continued interest and challenge to us as a board, because we do welcome that. We are better for challenge. So, uh, 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 so that's very much the ethos that we have. Thank you to all my colleagues from the board for attending uh, tonight, and um, and thank you for your continued interest in what, as Roland rightly says. This is a, an amazing hospital with, as other colleagues have said, amazing, amazing people working in it. Uh, uh, it's very um, uh, privileged to be associated with it, but we recognise that we do have major challenges and the next few months will continue to have the kind of challenges that Roland's expressed. So my thanks to everyone uh, 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 and good luck for the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>